Kepler's laws are a set of three physical laws which attempt to describe planetary motion and have had profound consequences on human life and our pursuit to gain knowledge on the universe we live in. They were first published by the German Johannes Kepler in the early 1600s, at a time before Isaac Newton was born, and the brightest minds in the world were still very much clueless when it came to space and beyond. This was the time where Galileo had only just started observing the heavens with his latest high-tech invention, a crude piece of glass. Sorry, I mean a refracting telescope. Yes, the seeds of physics and astronomy were only just being sowed at this time, and had not yet blossomed into the magnificent and exquisite practice we know them as today. In fact, Galileo was one of the first to use rigorous, like, scientific technique and experiment, and so is credited as the father of modern physics. But enough about him, he's not the focus of this video. Apologies, lad, maybe another time. Kepler had also developed his three laws at this time, which were remarkable and are still used today. They lead on from Copernicus and his model by suggesting elliptical orbits of planets around the Sun instead of circular, which, which fixes the need for random epicycles in orbits. Brilliant. And laid the foundations for future physicists and mathematicians like Newton to go on to further research into gravity and angular momentum, which then inspires more research, eventually bringing us to where we are today. Also brilliant. So now that the albeit brief history of these laws has been discussed, let's look deeper into each law, starting with Kepler's first law. Kepler's first law of planetary motion is quite simple. It states that the orbit of each planet is an ellipse, with the Sun at one of the foci. An easy way to look at and understand this law is by learning about the geometry of ellipses. Ellipses are a little bit like squash circles. They have a semi-major axis, which I'll label A, and a semi-minor axis, which I'll label B. Every ellipse has two foci along the, the major axis, which are equidistant from its centre. I'll call the from the centre to a focus C, which then defines the awesomely named eccentricity of an ellipse as C divided by A. These are the simplest interesting parameters of ellipses, and Kepler's first law states that the orbit of planets follows this shape, and the Sun must be at one of the foci. You may be able to see quite quickly that the higher the value of the eccentricity, the more stretched or elliptical the ellipse will be. And if the value of the ellipse's eccentricity is zero, it's known as a circle. Yes, all circles are just special types of ellipses. For things orbiting the Sun, like you right now on planet Earth, or Mars if you're watching this video many decades in the future, the eccentricity is close to zero. For Earth, its value is around 0.017, and for you Martians, you're a bit more eccentric at around 0.094. But you can see that these orbits are still close to zero, making the planet's orbit in almost perfect circles, but not quite. This leads to Earth being closer to the Sun at one point in the year, and furthest at another. Interestingly, Earth is closest during winter in the Northern Hemisphere, and furthest during summer. This was one of the astronomy facts covered in my last video, which I'd suggest watching once you're done with this one. Anyway, Kepler discovered his first law using observations of the orbit of Mars using that crude piece of refracting glass I mentioned earlier. Now on to Kepler's second law. This law states that planets sweep out equal areas and equal times in their orbits. This one's a bit harder to visualise than the first law, so I'll add an animation to help with the explanation. If he was to draw a line between the Sun and a planet at one stage in its orbit, and also at a later time in its orbit, that area would be the same for the same planet and time interval. This might be a hard idea to come to terms to, but I'd recommend thinking about gravity for a second. I'm sure you're aware that gravity is stronger when you're closer to an object. So when a planet is closer to the Sun, because remember its orbit is elliptical, it will be closer at some times than others. But when it's closer to the Sun, it gets pulled on stronger by gravity, accelerating its orbital speed. So the area swept out in a time interval will cover a larger angle due to the increased orbital speed from stronger gravity, but a smaller length as the distance of the Sun is shorter. When a planet is further from the Sun, gravity is weaker, and its orbital speed is therefore slower. That angle swept out will be smaller, but the distance is greater due to the planet being further from the Sun. Well, Kepler discovered that these two areas are the exact same for the same planet and the same time interval, which is quite remarkable. This is conservation of angular momentum in practice, and Kepler discovered this at a time when angular momentum itself hadn't even been mathematically discovered or written about. Lastly, Kepler's third law relates a planet's orbital period, which is the time it takes for it to complete a full orbital rotation around the Sun to its distance from the Sun. That is, the orbital period squared is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. Remember, the semi-major axis is the longer length when I discussed elliptical geometry earlier. This law can be easily derived nowadays using Newton's laws of gravitation and centripetal forces. The Sun's gravitational force is a centre-seeking force, or centripetal force, pulling in the planets, and because they have momentum, this force keeps them in circular motion, or near enough circular motion. 
So I can equate the gravitational force between the Sun and its mass Big M and the planet and its mass Little M with the distance or semi-major axis between them, A, to a centripetal force. I can replace the orbital velocity v with the distance around the orbit using an approximation that is a circumference with an orbital period, which I'll call t. Now, subbing this in for v and simplifying out an a and a little m gives this expression, or more simply, t squared is proportional to a cubed. Which is true since all this stuff is just a constant for things orbiting the same body like the sun. Really, big M is big M plus little m, but since big M is thousands of times bigger than little m, it can be approximated to just big M and still give a good value. This is the generic way one can derive Kepler's third law nowadays. There are more detailed derivations using ellipses and polar coordinates and ones which don't use approximations. However, they're long-winded, tedious, and honestly, just quite boring, so I'm not going to bother with them here. Also, the slight corrections they apply have minimal effects on the key result, that being t squared is proportional to a cubed. You can see that if I were to divide both sides by t squared, you'd be left with a cubed divided by t squared equals a constant. This can be worked out for each planet orbiting the Sun by looking at their average orbital radius, which is approximately equal to a, and their orbital period. Here's a list of the values of some of the planets where the constant is evaluated, and you can see that each planet gives a similar value which works as empirical evidence in support of Kepler's third law. A log plot can be used to further show this relation graphically. The fact this plot of semi-major axis against period is a straight line further supports that the ratio of a cubed divided by t squared is a constant. So it's looking really good for Kepler's third law at the minute. So now that I've discussed the three laws, you may now be thinking, why is this so significant? Why is this stuff important? Well, for one, as I already mentioned, these laws laid the foundations for future physicists to build from and discover more about the workings of the universe, in particular, orbital mechanics and gravity. This has allowed us to put satellites in orbit around Earth, leading to television, internet, weather tracking, GPS, among other vital services that we all use in our daily lives. This stuff isn't just important to astronomers and astrophysicists. It's also allowed for the development of things such as Hoffman transfer orbits, allowing interplanetary space travel, which will one day allow humans to leave Earth and colonise the rest of our solar system, helping us become a type 2 civilization and beyond. Therefore, these hundreds of year old laws, which seem simple, have had profound consequences on our lives and will hold significance for generations to come. And with that, I thank you for watching this short astronomy video. Feel free to like and subscribe, as well as comment any suggestions for future videos you'd like to see on this channel. Any and all feedback is appreciated.